think meditation is hard, do me a favor. Take a slow, deep breath in. And now breathe out. Congratulations. You just meditated. Hi, I'm Crystal Joukowsky, and this is Breathe In, Breathe Out, a weekly mindfulness and meditation podcast for anyone ready to own their own shit and find a little peace while doing it. Hello, welcome to Breathe In, Breathe Out. I'm Crystal Joukowsky, your host, and this week we talked to Bo Bissett. It was a wonderful conversation. Bo talked about how he moved a lot when he was younger and into his 20s, and he recognized that moving was running from his problems. So we talk a little bit more about that and how we have to realize that our own choices feed into the lives we live. Sound familiar? Something I talk about a lot. He also talks with me about the conscious and subconscious minds and how they feed into the program of our lives. I hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Hello and welcome back to Breathe In, Breathe Out. I'm Crystal Joukowsky and I'm excited to share this wonderful man with you. His name is Bo Bissett. So welcome to Breathe In, Breathe Out. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me today. Yeah, I'm excited for this conversation. I'm excited to open up um, more understanding and more clarity in how we can come through a bunch of crap and challenges that we've put ourselves in to then find new personal understanding and new growth. So you have quite the story. Would you share with our audience a little bit about you and what brought you to this place? Of course, I'd love to. The biggest thing that I've dealt with, that I've fought most of my entire life has been running, running from things. Mm-hmm. And I realized as I went through the work that I do now um, that that originated when I was 12 years old. My parents sat me and my brother down in their bedroom, called us together in this, like family meeting. They sat us down and they told us that we were, they were getting divorced. Mm-hmm. And my initial reaction was I, I stood up, ran out of the bedroom, out of the house and just like out, out of the neighborhood, into the woods. And I came back later that night because I was 12 years old and I didn't know where else to go because I was hungry. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, but yeah, that, and that was my, that became my de facto response when I got anxious, when I got scared, when you know things weren't going right for me, I just run. And you know, some people, you know, they you know quit a job or you know they move the house or you know, my thing ended up being eventually like I would just run. I I left leave the country. So in my twenties, I left. Um, I left America. I had re reignited my love affair with cocaine and. Because I'd started making some pretty good money, and so, and at that time, I'd already been in two accidents. I'd been in two drunk, drunk, uh, drunk accidents. The first one was when I was nineteen. Um, I was, I was, a, it was a single car accident. I was, I was drunk. I was driving. I was. Uh, there was a, a cop on the scene. He, he witnessed the whole thing. I was going hundred miles an hour. I flipped the car. Uh, into a telephone pole. I actually threw a telephone pole because I broke in half. And then I ended up in the, yeah, and obviously ended up in the hospital. And on the way there, or some sometime between that and the time that I became conscious, um, I did, my grandfather who had passed away before I was born showed up and told me, he was like, you know, it's not your time. He's like, go back. And so then two years later, I did the same thing. I was skateboarding. I'm drunk. I left a fraternity house and I was on my skateboard. I was going back to shower to go back to the party because I left work and I stopped and drank some beers and then had had a you know, shower. And I got hit by a car and I almost lost my leg. I got a staph infection. It was just nasty, right? So then... In my twenties, and I did, I was got, I got heavy on cocaine, and then I was like, uh, I, I couldn't tell my parents, like, you know, I'd already done so much damage, and I was just like, 
I'm leaving, man. And literally, I gave away everything I owned. Um, I booked a flight to London. I had a buddy there who was uh, just got out of the military. He's working in the private sector. And so I was like, yeah, I'll go see him for a little bit. I don't know. Let's see what happens. And on the way to the airport, I gave my brother the keys to my car. I was like, yeah, it's yours, man. Do whatever you want with it. And um, yeah, I just left and I started bouncing around from country to country. And, you know, everything, uh, I had saved some money. So, you know, it helped me, it gave me the ability to, if I did feel, you know, stressed or uncomfortable, I'd just leave. And I left. I started in England, then I went to the Czech Republic, then I went to Taiwan, then I bounced from Taiwan to uh, Mexico, then Vietnam, and Spain, and back to Taiwan and several times. So, it was uh that is that's my journey i was uh, basically you know, drinking and, and slowly killing myself with you know with these addictions and running that's, that's most of my most of my life until my, my late 30s and that's when i really figured i called my brother i was in vietnam at the time i was in ho chi minh i was basically passing out in the gutters of a third world country and I had lost everything. I lost uh, a business I was working on. I just lost a girlfriend. Uh, I was teaching English at the time. I lost that job. And I, I, had, I had nothing. Um, I called my brother. And I was sniffing heroin at the time. I called my brother. I was like, dude, I, I, don't, I don't know what's going on. I'm like, I don't know where I'm at. What's going on? Like, which way is up? It's just I, I know, my life is, I don't know what. It's like, come on. Come back home, and we'll sort you out. And so I, I went, I flew back to the States, and um, when, as soon as I got there, I was like, oh my God, what did I do? Like, you know, I've, I enjoyed, you know, I enjoyed being overseas. I enjoyed, you know, the life I was living. I enjoyed running away. And now I had to face, you know, I had to face everything. So that was tough. And I was like, well, how, how am I going to get myself out of the situation? So I, I don't know. I like traveling. Yeah. I like cycling. At this, at that point, I'd cycled through Taiwan, around Taiwan, through Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand. So I was like, all right, I just get a bicycle and I ride my way across America. And I was like, you know, I'll write a blog and like, you know, I'll just become like a travel writer. Yeah. So I started on the East Coast, like like on the beach in Atlanta Beach, North Carolina, and I made it all the way to uh, I stopped. Yeah, my last time was San Diego. And so I made it. You know, I, I went all the way across, but like nothing materialized. Right? I didn't, you know, I didn't get the job that I wanted. Or I, I didn't, you know, the business, create the business that I wanted. And I ended up with my aunt and uncle. And they were like, come back, you know, we'll, we'll help you get on your feet. Um, I was, uh, I, when I was with my aunt and uncle, I was up to about a case of beer. Actually, it was about an 18 pack because you could get those at uh, either care, uh, you call that place? Costco. Costco or Wine Plus. Um, yeah. You could get an 18 pack. So I, I got an 18 pack and I was going through that each day. And I was drinking Jack Daniels at night to put myself to, put myself to sleep. And at that point, my aunt, my aunt got breast cancer. And cool. that was like, just a big shake moment. Cause I was like, this, here was this woman who like had, you know, worked her tail off, you know, her and my uncle, they didn't have kids and they worked really hard. And they, you know, they very uh, successful financially. Uh, but yeah, here was this woman who had done, you know, seemed to do all, all the right things and then, you know, had breast cancer. And I was like, you know, I've done everything that I've, I've tried everything that I could try to kill myself, to put myself yeah. out of misery, my own misery, you know, and it hasn't worked. And here's this woman who's like, you know, worked her tail off and done, seem, you know, seemingly done all the right things, right? And it has, you know, yeah. has, has got breast cancer and like, who knows what will happen. Um, fast forward, my is fine. She's very healthy and she beat cancer. But um, yeah, that was, that was my that. wake up call. Yeah, it was like, dude, you know, what are you doing? Like, what is, yeah. 
And so that was it. So I just started reading. I started, uh, I started meditating. I started doing like any and everything like based on what I just told you, like, I mean, you know, maybe, maybe even a piece together that I, you know, I was pretty hardcore. Um, and, but that doesn't just translate into, you know, the drink. Like I do that with pretty much every aspect of my life. You know, when I'm, when I'm into something, I go a hundred percent. Yeah. And so the same thing was like when I was, you know, decided like, you know, to turn things around, I was like, all right, this is it. You know, I'm tired of this life. I, you know, I've, I'm, you know, almost 40 years old and I've, what have I accomplished? You know? So I just went full on. And I remember like, <laughs> I remember sitting in my bedroom at their house and like, I'd got like the I Ching um, book. <laughs> it was like some Chinese, you know, book mm-hmm. where you throw, throw sticks on the ground and like try to count them and figure out what uh-huh. your life is, how your life is going to turn out. I remember doing that. I was meditating. I was burning the incense in the room. I was just everything that I could think of. Like I was reading, you know, all the, the self-help gurus. I was doing everything I could to like, to turn things around. And uh, so I saved up money and I left and uh, ended up in Vietnam. Um, and put a lot of my, a lot of my self, uh, self-sabotaging behaviors just followed me. And like, it was, as I was, as I was getting better, as I was working on my, as I was working on myself, it was just, it was really, it was a really tough dance because it was like, I would take one step forward and one step back, you know? Mm. And it, it was not like, you know, sometimes you, you know, you, you know, you take two steps forward and one step back. Right. But I wasn't, I wasn't making any progress. Like I had just, you know, I had saved up some money and gotten out of, you know, out from under my, you know, uh, other, you know, from other people's uh, care or whatever, I guess you'd say. Yeah. But, you know, I was not, I was not moving forward. You know, by the time I got, I got to Vietnam, about almost uh, a year and a half later, I'd almost spent all the money that I'd spent, you know, that I'd saved. And I was just yeah. like, why do, why do I keep doing this stuff to myself? Like, you know, and same thing, like relationships, I was still botching relationships. I stopped drinking at that point. Um, and it was sure willpower. There was nothing, you know, nothing. It was just like, this is, this is how my life is going to, go from now on but I was just I was an angry sober person <laughs> sucked <laughs> <laughs> you're like I don't like it but I'm doing it anyway yeah uh, exactly right <laughs> and uh yeah but I was I my thing was exercise I really turned it into like you know exercise and healthy you know healthy or healthy eating right but I was still getting sick all the time I got dengue fever and uh in Vietnam, I got, I was getting food poisoning, like almost every, almost every month. It was just random. Like I was randomly just, there was, I was always finding ways to like, to hurt myself. That's and just go ahead. Crazy. Go ahead. No, I that's just crazy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and just, just, just punishing myself. And then, so I left Vietnam and I ended up back, ended up back in Taiwan. And I met the girl who is now my wife. Um, after the first month I had been, I was I was in Taiwan, and she was she was married at the time. We met on some uh, I don't know, I guess hookup site, <laughs> and you know she was just looking to for a distraction to her marriage. And we met, and it was like fireworks, just unbelievable. And I was like, wow. And it was actually the first t- the first date that we had. Um, just kind of, uh, yeah, our first date, I was like, uh, I'm going to marry you. She was like, well, I didn't know she was married at the time. So she was like, oh. ah, it's a little more complicated than that. And I was like, what? <laughs> so yeah, obviously <laughs> it was a little bit more complicated, but we sorted it out. And so we are together now. And, um, but she was going through her own thing, right? Saying so, basically yeah. she and I pushed and pulled each other through to the point where we are now. And as good as we we were together um, in our good times, like just unbelievable. Like just, I had never met or had anybody like this in my life. And just so amazing. 
we were equally bad in our bad times. Like our, our <laughs> arguments were pretty heated. And yeah. our last one uh, was about two and a half years ago. And it was like, all right, this is it, man. Either you know, we were both like, you know, either we get this stuff sorted out or like, you know, we, we go our separate ways. And so a friend of ours, a Buddhist monk, she introduced us to a guy who does a program called The Spiral. And mm -hmm. it, was, it was created by this Australian guy. And I was like, I oh, mean, I'll do whatever, man. I just, I've tried everything. I have like, I went to, when we, when I was, when I was going through like my, some of my physical stuff, my wife took me to this Chinese doctor who jabbed me, like literally jabs people with a stick. And we called him like, we, we nicknamed the guy Jabber Doctor. And I'm like, I mean, I had tried everything. Everything yeah. and then like so I was like I don't know I'll try this guy and it was like I, every time I left the office or his little hobble or whatever you call it I don't know I was like why do I keep going back to this guy who's jabbing me with a stick like what is wrong <laughs> like am I that desperate and I remember saying like you know a couple of times like you know when I was you know you know because when you're when you're healing when you're hurt when you're in pain you do anything right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm, I'm obviously, you know, married. Uh, I mean, I've told you I'm married to a woman. and But I remember several times, like, saying, you know, I will, you know, I will give oral sex to a man if that is what required for me to heal. Like, I will do anything. Like, just right. whatever. Desperation. Yeah, it's just so, you know, just, and God, it's just, it's just a really painful place to be. But... So anyway, I went through this. Um, I went through this uh, this program called the Spiral, and the first, the very first session was like all oh, the walls, all oh, the dams broke. I cried for like hours. I mean, probably half a day after this first session, and it was just and. What happened was I became aware of the fact that I had created the life that I was living. Right? <laughs> the choices that I was making mm -hmm. were had painted the picture that I was that I was looking at. And yeah. and from that session on, it just got better and better. Like life, my life instantly changed. And a lot, a lot of the things that I, that I did, it's like it's like I said, instant, instant change. But a lot of things that I wanted to have happen, or a lot, a lot, a lot of things that I wanted to change, didn't happen. Like a, the relationship with my wife, like it got a little bit better, but there was a lot of things that didn't didn't get better. And I like we're still arguing and. Um, so I was like, all right, so how do I fix this? And so I took what, you know, I took what I had learned from this individual, basically the, what he had taken me through, and I started applying it to myself. And I started building my own protocol, I guess you say. And yeah, and I can't remember the last time my wife and I yelled at each other. Um, addiction my addiction is gone like i i actually had quite a few beers last night um <laughs> and you know the funny thing is um you know i had yeah i think i had some fun last night. but you know the funny thing is like i that was my choice and i can do that now like I can have a beer if I want. I can have like I had, you know, I had six last night. Um, <laughs> you know, it sounds funny. Um, just, you know, that I'm kind of playing with. You know, you might think, wow, you know, you're playing with fire, but I'm, I'm not. I beat, I beat the addiction. And then, yeah. you know, because I haven't, I haven't, you know, I haven't done that in uh, months. Uh, it was just I was just had a day, and I was like, you know, I just need to you know, get away from everything, and, and I, I don't 
you know, that was, that was my choice. And, yeah. you know, as I was going through this work, as I was, the, the individual took me to the spiral world. So I was going through that. I remember talking to the guy and I was like, you know, if, if we're, if we're getting into these emotions, you know, if we're releasing these emotions that I have attached to addiction, you know, I should be able to drink again, right? Or I should be able to, you know, yeah. And he was like, uh, man, don't, uh, I, I wouldn't recommend it. And I was like, uh, you know what? I'm going, you know, I, you know, I want to, I want to get to the point. Cause I was always, you know, I was always envious when I was, uh, when I had friends, uh, when I was younger and that, you know, I could go out with people and I knew that they would go out, but then the next night, you know, they would sit at home and watch movies. Right. Or, you know, or, you know, and, or maybe not go out for a month, you know, and, yeah. and I was always envious that pe they, they, these people could turn that off. You know, there was a switch they could turn it off. You know, I didn't have a switch. It was like, you know, as soon as I started, it was like pff, full on, man. You know, it's a party. Yeah. And the party never stopped. And so I was like, you know, but I should be able to because this drinking, this, this addiction is, um, you know, it's me, it's, it's my self-sabotage, it's a way of me hurting myself. Yeah. So I should be able to do it. And he's like, you know, he's like, again, he said, I wouldn't recommend it. And so I, anyway, I tried it. So I tried, I had a glass of wine. And then um, a weekend, the week later, I had a, you know, two glasses of wine. And then the, the weekend after that, I had half a bottle. And I was like, whoa, I could feel like, I could feel the thing waking up again. So I went through, and like I said, I, I went through this, this protocol and I used it to, to really get down to the, the nitty gritty of what I was, uh, what I was holding on to. And yeah. Like I said, I mean, last night's the first time I've, I've had beers in oh, ages, months, right? And it might be, you know, it might be another six months until I have you know, another beer. Um, but the thing is, like, I have that choice now. And it's yeah. like, uh, it's amazing. Um, <laughs> it's out of the, of the things that I've done in my life, that's, that, that is the most proud thing that I've, that I've accomplished. I've beat it. There are several things that I want to touch back on of what you have been through and what you have talked about. One thing I want to say really quick to those people who are out there and struggling with addiction, if you need help, I encourage you to find that help, whatever that help is, whatever, whether it's professional, whatever you need to kick that, you know your situation and you know how to work through that. You can be free of it. You can work through that. Um, just like Bo has done that. And only you know your limits and your abilities. So please know that we support you in whatever path you need to take and where you need to be. I was recently talking to somebody else about addiction and about stopping things that they were addicted to or tempted by. And, um, we came down to this conversation about there are a lot of smokers actually who quit smoking, but they still carry a cigarette with them because just being able to hold it and acknowledge I could if I want to. I don't want to, but I could if I wanted to and recognizing that it's a choice now instead of an a pole that says you've got to do this or needing that for the release has shifted or um, any other people that are addicted to food or whatnot and being able to say I could if I choose to, but I don't need it now. I love that you dove into the why, like, why am I acting this way? Why am I doing this? In the very beginning, you started this saying that you like to run, Mm -hmm. At what point did you recognize that that was one of your issues? Not until I went through this work. It was like, you know, and, you know, it's, it's out of something that's so blatantly obvious, right? Sometimes we're just like completely, I just thought like, you know, I just thought I like, you know, moving around. I like the, you know, because by the time I was, uh, I think I was like 18 years old, I think we had moved house like over a dozen times. Um, you know, between, I don't know, my mom and dad, they moved like before I was, before we were 12 years old, I think we moved house like 10 times. Yeah. And then my dad with my dad, we see, 
after they got divorced, my dad moved uh, probably in the span of like six years. I think he moved like five or six times. It was ridiculous. So like, yeah, over like like 15 times I'd moved and, you know, by the time I was like 18. And, and you know, it wasn't, it was like in the same uh, city. <laughs> You know? I'm, I have a very similar story. My parents before, so my parents sat us down when I was eight years old. So uh, four years before you and said, we're not good together and we're getting a divorce. And yeah. before that, it was like almost, it felt like every six months we were moving again and again. So before I was eight, we were all over the place. And ironically, after I was eight, after they divorced, they both were more stable. Uh, it was almost like we're moving to get away from all of this negativity and all of that upset and frustration because yeah, they would yeah. fight a whole bunch. But uh, then all of a sudden they divorce and they're in different states and magically they can breathe right? They can, they don't have to deal with each other's crap. They don't right. have to deal with each other's baggage from how they were raised up and whatnot. And they get to do their own thing. And I think my dad moved two or three times in the same town from like eight to when I graduated from high school. And my uh, mom did the same. She only moved a couple of times. And so it was just this Im wow, let me take a peek into your life right now and recognize yeah, right? there's something behind that let's run away. And yet those problems keep following you. Those problems keep uh -huh. coming and they're in your face saying, are you ready to deal with me yet? Are you ready to face this yet? Yeah. At what point are you going to acknowledge that there's something more to your moving and your running? Um, well, most people go like a lifetime, right? I mean, we yeah. you know, we just think that that's the way that we are, right? And we don't, you know, even when people, other people bring it up, we're like, yeah, you know, we, we get used, no matter how, you know, how jacked up, you know, whatever we're doing is, it's our normal, right? And so yeah. it's just the way it is. It's, it's all good. No, no. I just like to move. I'm a gypsy. I like yeah. to, you know, I have that nomadic lifestyle and it feels good on me. And yet yeah. sometimes it's nice. Like I absolutely understand how that nomadic lifestyle can feel great because uh -huh. I, it, it teaches you a lot about yourself and about like making friends or adjusting to new cultures and new mm -hmm communities and whatnot and in the same aspect it feels so good to be settled and uh, grounded yeah. i'm settled you know? now and it's nice i mean it's nice to <laughs> you know it's nice to you know to know what to expect it's nice to you know to have my routine and you know yeah because i don't i mean i've you know through through the growth that i've done over the last decade of healing it's like you realize that you know it is in the it's in it's in the repeatable things that we do that you know we build what we you know, you know we, we sow our field or whatever we call it you know, we harvest our field you know. yeah right yeah. yeah so you know if you're you know, you know it's hard to you know it's hard to grow something without, you know, if you constantly move, right? So I've settled down and now yeah. it's, uh, yeah, now I'm in a good spot, really good spot. So, uh, how do you feel about frustration? Frustration. Um, that was <laughs> one of my, that was my biggest, one of my biggest things. I was like, I was frustrated with everything. I was so yeah. frustrated with that I couldn't, you know, drink like normal people. I was so frustrated that I couldn't, you know, um, I couldn't feel calm. I wasn't, I was never comfortable. And I wasn't comfortable with my own skin. And like, I didn't, I didn't really like partying um, or being like, being with big groups of people or being at the bar. And, but it was just one of those things that I I started doing and to, I had to drink to, to be comfortable doing it. And it was just like, you know, this big cycle, just, just, uh, 
perpetuated itself and compounded in itself. Um, and I realized frustration um, recently. Frustration can be the key to our salvation. Um, because so? the way, well, imagine two different gears. So the, on the first gear, the bottom gear, I guess you say, is uh, your your subconscious program. So it's emotions that you've embodied as a child and ones that really do all the directing of your life. And they, you know, most of us run on routine, on autopilot, the majority of our day. And so it's those programs that actually run the show. We always, you know, we all think, you know, especially Americans. Americans are big on like freedom, you know, I'm free. No, you're not. <laughs> if you're on, you know, if you're running on routine, then like you're basically a slave to the programs, the emotions that you've, you've held on to you know, as you, you, the emotions that you, your subconscious uses to, to dictate how you, how you feel about everything. Uh, and as we're, because that's just how we're wired. The subconscious, as soon as we're born, or not actually not long after we're conceived, the subconscious is grabbing onto everything all the energies, all the emotions, all the things that you see and feel and smell and taste and touch and all of that. And it uses that to create, you know, to create the, the picture of how you react to the world. So mm -hmm. that is your program, that is your matrix, right? And then your conscious. Your conscious intention, what you want, is the, the other gear. So back to the gear, I kind of digress for a minute. But so you've got these two gears. You've got your conscious intentions, you know, is the top gear, and your subconscious programs. And the frustration that you feel is the friction between those two gears, mm. between your conscious intentions. Because, you know, for, you know, for example, for me, right, you know, I wanted to stop drinking. I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to abuse myself. I didn't want to uh, do, to, to hurt myself in that way, right? But my conscious, my subconscious program told me that I was not a good person, that I was mm -hmm. not worthy of the same uh, abundant life uh, that my friends and family enjoyed, right? So I had to... Yeah destroy myself in, in one way or the other. Now, you know, you might, you might, you might have that issue with food. You might have that issue with work. You might have that issue with sex. You might have, you know, there's, you know, thousands and thousands of different programs that we've installed that are running counter, counter productive to what we actually want. So that yeah. frustration that we feel is that friction between what we actually want and what our subconscious is saying, no, you can have that. You can try all you want, but that ain't happening. Good luck. Yeah, exactly right. So <laughs> that's my take on frustration. I love it. I love the imagery of it. I'm absolutely a storyteller as well. <laughs> and I love the imagery of that, you know, that right there, that friction that you feel. To be able to put a visual to it and for people to actually see it in some way and know that's what you're dealing with. So when you feel that friction and that frustration, now you have a choice point. Mm -hmm. Now you have the ability to say, which side do I want to deal with? Which side do I want to believe? And what do I need to do to add a little WD-40? Yeah, exactly. It's just spotlight right on that issue, right? That's what yeah, I need to work like, on. So anyway, you're feeling frustration, you know, like that is where, you know, that's where you need to work. So it's like a, yeah, it's like a blaring alarm for, you know, like, <laughs> focus on that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And those, I mean, oftentimes you, you talk about us not really being free because of the emotions and the programming that are there and like shining that light onto the emotion. What emotion is it really? It's more than just anger. There's something underneath it. So what's really going on? Where are you really at? And you shine the light on it and then you clean it out and things are a lot better. Like once you understood that running away was part of your friction and that you had an opportunity to embrace it and say, okay, I don't want to do that anymore. 
it's, yeah, you just cleaned it out and greased the wheels a little bit. And now life is so much easier. Oh, so much easier, right? It's just, uh, yeah, I mean, and that's, a, you know, I realized that, you know, as, as I was, you know, for so long, so frustrated and so angry about, you know, the, the, the path that I was on. But then I realized as I started, you know, fixing everything, I was like, well, you know, that's what we're here for, right? We're here to fix things and we're here to like, to get better, you know? And it's the, it's the friction and the bumps and the, you know, the mountains that we have to climb that, you know, add to the scenery and, you know, make things. Cause otherwise, like, I don't know, most of us, you know, well, not most of us, I can't say that. You know, a lot of people just kind of, we, we try to numb ourselves to, you know, and we do it with however, like, you know, I use alcohol, some people use food, some people use work, some people, you know, whatever, but we, we use whatever it is to keep ourselves asleep, you know? And then, you know, the thing is like, that's just how we, that's how the human body works. Like our subconscious is, you know, it tries to keep us asleep to, you know, so, because if we're, if we're asleep, if we're running on routine, the subconscious is in control. And then like the subconscious likes to be in control because then, you know, then you're not out doing anything to, you know, to threaten what it's already, you know, what it's already programmed. Mm-hmm. Right. I think Eleanor, I'm going to paraphrase here. It's not exactly the quote, but Eleanor Roosevelt said something to the effect that, you know, do something do something each day to challenge yourself or like step outside of your comfort zone or yeah. you know, to, kind of, to be uncomfortable, do something each day to be uncomfortable. And I think that I realized recently that, that is the, the biggest, the biggest secret to like really changing your life. And you've, I've heard like Arnold Schwarzenegger and a few other like, you know, successful people talk about, you know, just getting 1% better each day. And that, yeah. you know, that is kind of, it's, it's, it's a similar thing, right? Cause it, if you're, if you're trying to get better each day, then you're pushing the envelope and you're doing something, you know, that might be a little bit uncomfortable you know, each day. And by doing so you're staying a step ahead of the subconscious, which means you're staying a, a step ahead of uh sleepy land, right? You're <laughs> yeah. 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 You're choosing to be a little more awake. You're choosing to be a little bit more aware. You're choosing to actually be present in your life instead of going through. I think that the subconscious, we, the subconscious takes over and it's almost a way to protect us. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, I get to do this and we're just living in our box and we're existing and -hmm. we're existing in this safety because that's what we've learned. And every now and then, you know, a part of the box gets dented, like, like a delivery that came in. Um, (laughs) And you're like, wow, that's, I'm not sure I liked that. And you have a chance to use that friction to shift something or say, no, it's okay. I don't mind. I don't mind it when it rains and that little, little bit of water comes in. It's okay. Not a big deal. Maybe. Um, so our con- our subconscious tries to protect us and our conscious is like, but what if there was more? Yeah. What if we could be a little happier? What if we could find a little more joy? What if mm-hmm. we could learn something and stretch a little and it might be uncomfortable and yet, Look at what's there on the other side. It's gorgeous and it's happy and it's fulfilling. And it just brings us into this space of, yes, and I'm living and I'm making these choices and life is so good. (laughs) Exactly. It's just a nice, nice place to be. Yeah. Yeah. I'm... I, I love it. I think it's absolutely fantastic and wonderful. So, so what do you do now? Now that you've changed your life around, now that you have embraced a new way of being, now that you've acknowledged that your subconscious does not have to be the one pulling the strings, what do you do? Now I am standing here with my arm extended, helping other people. 
traveled down yeah. the path. Yeah, so that's what that's what Amoni is. Um, I went through this program, this protocol called the Spiral, and like I said, it was, like changed my life and did so many amazing things. Um, but you know, just it scratched the surface of what I wanted, what, yeah. what, what I really intended to have happen. And one of the, one of the biggest things that I experienced as I was going through this uh, this process was anxiety. Like when you when you find the emotions, when I'm a I'm going to yeah, build on the back of uh, this, this program called the spiral. And it's, we use muscle testing uh, to find the emotion. We use the meridian chart, which is like uh, kind of like a map to peg the emotions on the body to find out where they are. And then there are release points on the body, like physical release points that correspond yeah. to where the emotions are found. Um, and so, and then we use breathing to get it out. Well, mm-hmm. one of the things that, like, my anxiety was big for me, huge. Like, I was just constantly gnawing on my fingers. And it was just like, I was, as I was going through this process, um, I would have, and I had never had anxiety at all. Um, but as I was releasing these emotions, the anxiety came up. It was huge. And I was, it was so, it was crippling. It was like, <gasps> I, mean, yeah. I could breathe and like, I, you know, I felt like, you know, one of those people that, you know, picks up a plastic, I, I never actually picked up a bag and you know, did it, but I felt like, Oh my God, oh, mm-hmm. am I losing? Do I need to do that? <laughs> and yeah. uh, my, my wife at the, at the time, she was going through a you know, Reiki course. And mm-hmm. so she would help me. Um, she would help me move the anxiety, you know, with Reiki. And yeah. really, it really helped. But I, at the same point, I was like, I don't want to, like, I don't want to rely on her. Like, and I, and I feel like, you know, every time I'm like anxious, like, oh, honey, like, oh, can you, you know, I felt like that. Yeah. I'm like, I don't want to be like that, you know, no. um, depending on her to help me out. So it was one of these intuitive, you know, leaps or I don't know, things that ha- just happened. I was, just, I was doing this work. Um, amo in Spanish means I love, right? Mm-hmm. So, and I was thinking about love and I was thinking about like, you know, love, using love as healing and, you know, doing, you know, doing this work and breathing. Like, I don't know, everything just came together. And so I came up with this amo breath and amo is A-M-O, you spell it, you know, A-M-O. Um, the first part of this ama breath is um, we take a deep breath in, like a kundalini breath up, up the spine, up to the top of the head, so then breathe in. And then when you breathe, the exhale is ah. Uh, we imagine light coming in and down our throat and into the chest is ah. Uh, and with the M is more of like a hum. It's also a mm-hmm. We imagine that that light that came in through the crown of our head, down to our throat, into our chest, it's swirling like in a clockwise direction. And we use that to pull the energy and the emotions that we've connected with um, into our heart center. So, and with yeah. the O, oh, oh, we imagine the, all of that energy that we've collected plus the, the light that we've used to cleanse it shooting out of our chest. And as I was doing this, I don't know, just, like I said, it's one of those things just like, I don't, I don't know how it happened. And as I started doing it, I was like, whoa, dude, this is like mega powerful. And um, so I started incorporating that in my practice and it was like, it just changed everything. Like this, the, the energy, the anxiety that I was feeling just like, bam, just instantly disappeared. And um yeah, so, and then, let's see, and then we also use, at the interview session, we use neuro-linguistic programming. So that's, that's Amorini, so what it, what, it, uh, what it is. And the knee part is, uh, uh, knee in Chinese means you. Uh, so Amo in Spanish means I love, and knee in Chinese means you. I use two different, I mean, use two different languages because this is a blend, right? It's a blend of, you got muscle testing, you got breathing, um, you got meridian chart. I mean, it's a little bit of a little bit of yeah. everything, right? And then neuro linguistic programming. So it's just like a, a big hodgepodge of uh, awesome healing modalities. 
combined into yeah. one to like really just zap what you what you what you program mm. and to let it all go and I think like I yeah love like the, the big thing but the funny thing is like the first book the first book that I read the first book that I bought when I was uh when I started my Halo journey was called Love Yourself Like uh like your life depends on it I think yeah. It was written by this tech guy, like, uh, and he was going through depression. And he figured out like love is the answer, right? Love heals yeah. all, you know, love, love. So I was like, I don't know. When I, f- I first read that, I was like, cool, man, I'll buy into that. And so I put the sticky note on my bathroom uh, mirror at my aunt and uncle's place when I was with them, right? And I remember yeah. looking at it each day and I was like, I love you, I love you. And I was looking at myself saying that. And like, and I kind of started to get into it. Then, then I was like, Psst. Dude, I, I hate that guy. That guy's a jacket. You know, I don't, I hate it. Like, I, and I just ripped it down and like, I just never paid attention to it ever again. But the funny thing is like, after I got to the point as I did this work, um, that now, yeah, I, I do. I look in the mirror and I'm like, that dude's awesome. I love that dude. You mean it came full circle? Yeah, exactly. So that's kind of, <laughs> Yeah, that's what I'm gonna need. Like that's kind of you know, it's a, you know, that's where that all came from. Just you know, and that's my goal. So like when I take people through this work, is to have them say the same thing, right? To have yeah. them fall in love with themselves and you know, really appreciate you know, because you know, it's really you know, it's an enlightening when you realize that like the where you are is because of the emotion that you program so basically you know wherever you are it's you like you did it right mm-hmm. no matter what happened to you you know if you got you know beat up or you know or abused or you know it wasn't that thing wasn't your fault but what you know the emotion that you held on to as in in response to that you know to that happening like you did that you 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 held on to those emotions right and they those emotions shape have shaped your life so in essence like it is your fault right you know you you created the reality that you're living right now and when you realize that it is such a powerful moment because you're like you know what if i did this then i can undo it yeah and that's when that's when your life is yeah. like, ooh, man, just go from yeah. zero, zero to 60 in like no time. <laughs> that's, that's, that's like that pivotal moment of understanding. That's the moment that I hope that we can all get to is the, I have the power to change this. I have the power to be something different, to do something different, to create a different life. And you may not be able to do it on your own. You may need help. Most of us need help. Most of us do. Most of us cannot do it all by I couldn't do it on my own, you know? And I tried and tried. I tried for almost a decade, you know? And I just, like, it wasn't until my wife was like, you know, we we get help or, like, this is it. And I was like, ah, all right. (laughs) I don't want to hear that. Do not tell me I have to change because that just makes me kick against the pricks more. But the reality is that that we all have that defining moment that tells us it's time to start looking into the friction. And if we take that moment and open up and reach out for the hand that's stretched out for us saying, hey, I've been there. I totally get what you're going through. and I understand the pain. I understand the upset. I understand the heartache. And I am absolutely here to let you know that you can do this exactly. and you can shift it and you can live a life that you love. Exactly. The yeah, thing yeah. is like, what you're talking about is like, you know, you know, you understand the pain, you know, and it's so true because like, You know, we all think like, oh, you know, I'm, you know, my thing is different. No, it's not. You know, you might be dealing with like, you know, know, food addiction or you might be dealing with, you know, whatever, you know, but like we're we're all going through the same thing, right? It's just different vehicles that we use to, you know, to manifest the experience. Like, so, you know, it's just, uh, 
Yeah, you it's the are different not, programming to, that yeah. feeds into how we perceive it differently, how we feel it differently. The way I grew up, and if I was dealing with your stuff versus the way that you grew up and you dealing with your stuff, we're going to see it through a different lens. And mm -hmm. at the base of it is loss. At uh, the core of it is that insecurity, that unstable foundation, and that seeking for love and fear of abandonment and all of the other things that go into that. And if you go down to that core and recognize what's really there, we can see better. You know, there's the old um, bumper sticker that says, Every, everyone is going through something, so be kind. Exactly. And, that's right. That's exactly where we're at. Every single one of us has shit. Every single one of us has this crap that is, that feeds into our baggage and how we react to everything around us, the world, the people, our, our loved ones, everything. And recognizing that, mm-hmm, yeah, we've all got it. And I'll give myself some love and I'll give you some love. And let's just get through this thing that we call life together because quite frankly, none of us gets out of it alive. So yeah, I like that. <laughs> we might we might as well be a little bit kinder while we're here right now. Exactly. So Bo, do you teach online? Do you teach in person? How do people contact you? How do people learn this this Beautiful yeah, tool. I, yeah, the web the website uh, is the best place to, to go. Uh, I've got a love hate uh, affair with love affair love hate affair. I guess is that what you said? Yeah, with uh, <laughs> social media. So um, yeah, I'm like in and out, in and out. But uh, yeah, my website is my hub. Like I'm, I'm very consistent. Like you know, keeping up with you know, uh, keeping up my website and my blog and everything like that. So. Yeah, if this resonates with you, then reach out. Um, I'm also doing some uh, some live webinars um, weekly. So yeah, uh, you yeah. can register. You can register for when and where that pops up um, on the website. Yeah, it's the best place to reach me. Amoniclear.com. Fabulous. You guys, I'm constantly encouraging you to find something that works for you. Because what works for one doesn't work for somebody else. If you are remotely intrigued by Amani, if you are remotely connecting with Bo's life story and all of the challenges that he has been able to survive through and thrive through, I highly encourage you to seek him out. We'll have his um, contact information in the show notes below. And thank you so much for being here, Bo. Before I let you go, I have a couple of little questions. Thank you so much for sharing your platform with me. I really, really appreciate it. Very... I'm absolutely delighted. I have two questions. Far away. If you could give our listeners a journaling prompt, something to ponder and then write about, what would that be? Oh, um, wow. <laughs> sorry, I didn't um, give you a heads up. <laughs> no, nah, sorry, I'm because I'm a big writer. Um, uh, I think maybe who am I? Maybe that'd be a good, good start. Okay. So guys, who am I? Go deep. Who are you? Not just right this second, but like, what are you feeling? Where did you come from? What is your makeup? Who are you? And then my second question for you is, what is your favorite form of self-care? Oh my God. <laughs> oh. I'm, I'm always, I'm constantly changing. You know, I've really, I think the breathing, probably breathing is one of my biggest, like my most staple, the AMA, the AMA breath. Um, if you're curious, go check out my YouTube channel. I got a free video on the AMA, the AMA breath. Um, if you didn't hear what I, the description yeah. of how I told you how to do it in this podcast, but um yeah breathing is a big one for me um i think learning too i mean with uh yeah learning anything like right now i'm doing chess i'm learning how to play chess and mm. so just constantly like i was saying earlier you know like the whole you know with eleanor roosevelt saying just like just constantly trying to grow and get better yeah i think that 
that betterment, you know, that pursuit of uh, growth is a great method of self care because, like, you're you're constantly, you know, doing something better, right? So. Okay, that is a new one, and I love it. I absolutely <laughs> love that. I love the concept of learning and feeling free enough to take something new in as self-care. So you guys heard it here from Bo. Learning is beautiful self-care because you get to grow a little bit, and you might learn something that will help you apply and shift your life. Thank you for being here. Oh, my Thank gosh. Thank you so much. Uh, it's like this, I really appreciate it. This has been absolutely fantastic. And I'm truly grateful that you've been here. So, hey, guys, I love you. I'm glad that you joined us. And until next week, we'll have you again on Breathe In, Breathe Out. I hope this moment of self-care and healing brought you some hope and peace. I'm Crystal Joukowsky on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and I hope you check us out and follow along for more content coming soon. I look forward to being with you again here on Breathe In, Breathe Out. Until next time, take care.